Amy has become quite a big box office hit here in Australia, in the UK and in the United States. How do you feel about the film now that it's out there making an impact? Well, obviously it's just really, really incredibly satisfying that the film is finding such a good audience in so many different countries. You know, it's doing really well in Australia and France and the UK and America. So, you know, it's a strange process because you get so immersed in these films and they take years and years to make and then suddenly they're out there in the world and you don't control them anymore and you just hope that people respond to them. But, yeah, we're delighted. I mean, you know, it's been a challenging process, obviously, because it's a very, it's a very challenging subject and um, this you know, situation was challenging, but... You know, audiences seem to be taking a lot out of the movie, which is uh, very satisfying. What was your main intention with this film? You know what? It's a good question, because we didn't really know when we went in. We just knew there was something about her we had to kind of work out. We had to work out how or why what happened did happen. But as the process evolved, our main intention became basically... When we basically worked out who she was, we sort of wanted to share her with the world and rebrand her, because... I don't know what it looked like in Australia, but certainly in the UK and perhaps in America, you know, she became this sort of, you know, this tabloid joke, and um, she became the, was just basically a bad punchline, and we were sort of determined to open people's eyes to who she really was, and, you know, A, the talent, but B, the fact that, you know, she had major issues that needed explaining, and it wasn't just, um, she wasn't just some car crash sort of self-indulgent worst space. She was a young girl with a lot of issues, and that needed to be shown and then put into the context of her talent. So that's been that was, became the main sort of you know mission to achieve the movie. Okay. Really, there is so much tabloid clutter and sensationalism about Amy Winehouse. What was the process like of deciding what you were going to include and what you were going to leave out? It was a it's very difficult because. The problem we encountered with this movie was that all of her really good friends, her real inner thanks, took this vow of silence after she died, never to speak to the media. So they were obviously the people we wanted to speak to, but they didn't want to speak to us. So to begin with, we just did this huge troll of all the usual archive sources like the BBC and MTV, whatever it might be, Associated Press, all the news stations. But you can get anybody can get that footage, you know, that's the easy bit, the bit you want, the stuff you want is the kind of, you know, other home movies, it's the kind of behind the scenes stuff and she's chilling out at home or with her friends relaxing or mucking about. So we had to unlock that those archive sources and that took us years really because there was no trust, you know, they'd been burnt before. They didn't know whose agenda we were following and what the kind of ambition was for the movie. So Really, that was the, the key, that was the challenge, and the great thing about that was that as soon as we did unlock those people, we saw all the early footage of the girl before she was famous, and that's the real her, obviously, so that was the uh, that was the beginning of the process, and then it was about just unlocking all of those little, uh, little treasure chests one by one. How does a producer win the trust of people who don't want to talk? Well, you start off by making them watch Senna, <laughs> which is our, our calling card, you know, and a lot of them had seen it and kind of liked that movie. So listen, we were like, listen, we make high quality stuff. We make stuff with a lot of integrity. You can see the way that we actually deliver here, which is all archive based. There's no talking heads, there's no narration. So that was one. But then it was just a question of you literally reassuring them over a period of time, over and over again, maybe showing them a little bit and just getting to know them and them getting to know us. And then realizing that we weren't a bunch of cowboys that were going to do anything too salacious or kind of tabloidy. Um, and that was it, really. It's just that sort of, you know, you have to sort of just become friends. You have to sort of just earn the right for them to participate. So it was very difficult. It took a long time. And, you know, if I'd been in their shoes, I would have been really reluctant as well. But I'm really happy to report that we've all seen the movie now. And we've done what we said we were going to do, which is what they wanted us to do. But they didn't really think we'd get there. And I think also we thought at some point somebody would pull the plug on us as well and kind of say, you know what, guys? take the edges off, let's kind of make this a bit more palatable, let's make this a bit more user-friendly, let's not be quite so honest with this. But you know what? People behind the movie stuck to their word and, you know, backed us to the hill. Yeah, that's interesting because on the one hand, the film really respects her talents as a songwriter. At the same time, you do not hold back in showing the depths and the real tragedy of addiction. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean... You know, they go hand in hand, unfortunately. Everything in this story is completely interwoven. You know, she, she writes songs to make sense of her trouble, you know, and her, you know, her issues. And, you know, the way we all looked at it is that music is her kind of salvation to begin with, and it's her way of making sense of the world. But then, unfortunately, 
the music, in primarily in the shape of that one song, Rehab, becomes too successful. And you know, Rehab so ironic, wasn't it? Obviously, because it's about the fact that people are trying to get her to rehab and she's resistant, even though she knows in her heart of hearts that she needs to go. And so then the music becomes this kind of massive millstone around her neck because it, you know, it just triggers this enormous juggernaut of a machine. But she knows, you know, early days is not going to be the way for her to, you know, to survive. She knows that if she becomes massive, she's going to really struggle with it and she does while the film has been met with big audiences and critical acclaim her father Mitch Winehouse is very upset with the film as is Blake Fielder her ex-husband uh, what has the overall fallout been with her family well for a start Blake's not really upset Blake's pretty happy with the movie oh okay I'm very sorry about that no no no, no fair enough you know, one would assume he would but you know what Blake's a lot smarter than people give him credit for it I think also you know, he was a very convenient target, Blake, at the time. He was a very convenient scapegoat. And listen, he's clearly no angel. He, he would never profess to be any sort of angel himself. He's got a lot of issues himself. But, you know, she was looking for somebody like Blake all along, I think, in my opinion. I could be wrong, but I think she was looking for somebody like Blake from, from early doors. And, you know, if it wasn't him, it would have been another guy like him because she wanted somebody who had as many, you know, structural issues as she did so that she could transfer into that person as opposed to looking out for herself, which is, you know, I don't want to become a cos psychologist, but it's a fairly classic sort of fiction style behaviour. But anyway, so he's okay with the movie. He kind of thinks it's pretty on the level. And, you know, he said to me very early on before I'd even seen it, you know what, I shouldn't come out of this movie well. So don't worry if I do, it's because I shouldn't. So he's pretty grown up about it. Um, Mitch, you know, it's a very complicated situation because at the end of the day, she was his daughter. He was her dad. I wasn't her dad, she wasn't my daughter. So I respect his point of view, you know, he knew her a lot better than I did, I didn't know her at all. And I think the pro part of the problem with uh, his kind of uh, take on the movie is that I think he just envisaged a different type of movie altogether, one which kind of maybe didn't look at some of the more troubling aspects of the story. You know, maybe he wanted us to focus more, more on other more palatable aspects of the story. But, you know, if we'd made a movie about a 27-year-old girl who's that famous, who drank herself to death, you know, consciously or unconsciously, and we didn't try to drill down into some of the key issues, then we would have been slammed by everybody, rightly so. But, you know, and listen, at the end of the day, you're not going to unlock a movie. You're not going to unlock some, somebody's addiction issues in the space of a two-hour movie. You could spend years trying to work out Amy Winehouse. You probably never get to the very bottom of her because it's not that simple. Nothing's black and white. But I think, you know, we had to go to places he probably didn't want us to go. And he doesn't agree with some of our conclusions, but, you know, pretty much everybody else does in some shape or form. I mean, the mum's seen it and thinks it's pretty pretty spot on. And all of her friends have seen it. All the people she worked with have seen it, and they all think it's pretty spot on. So, you know, he's kind of out on a limb, but he it's his prerogative to be out on that limb because he's her dad at the end of the day. So, you know, you can't win them all. How closely does a producer like you work with the director? Are you, in a sense, the co-director of the film? No, I wouldn't say that, but what we have is a really great working relationship. Myself, Asif, and Chris King, the editor, we all made Senna together. And we'll do more movies. I mean, I've made four movies now with, Asif, with Chris King, the editor, who's a fantastic you know, documentary editor. So, I mean, literally, they're in the room next door, cutting away. Asif comes and goes. Chris barrels through all the archive, which is thousands of hours. But we have, a, like, a big filtration system. So the stuff that gets to him has been through about five filters before he sees it, and then he kind of works out where the holes are. So it's really about just, you know, we have a, we spend a lot of time talking about what we're trying to say with the, the film and what we're trying to, whatever the movie is. And it's a very, very sort of um, symbiotic process. It's a really healthy working process, I have to say. We're all friends at the end of it, which isn't always the case in movies, as you know. And, um, you know, we're very lucky to be able to make these movies because, you know, Senna and Amy are both, great responsibilities you know the big things you to take on board you, you guarantee you're going to get them right you also did a great job with all this mayhem which was a huge hit here in australia yeah no we loved that project that was a you know the massive ball bust of that project but it was again that you know the papas brothers were fantastic fit characters and you know we wanted to do them justice my love handling is an absolutely diamond unique human being so it was a real privilege to make that movie and uh, it was a bit more low budget that one so it was a real you know it was really tough game but it was uh, we were really really pleased with the end product as well 
you are again dealing with the issues of addiction. Is that just a coincidence? <laughs> they're just uh, more interesting human beings have got issues, haven't they? They just haven't, you know, some of them may be addictions. Or... Listen, you know, we've all got our problems, haven't we? Let's face it. But I think that, you know, we just, it's just a complete coincidence. But there are similarities there between Taz and uh, Amy's journey. I think just incredibly bright, talented human beings that are very fragile and, you know, vulnerable at the same time, but it's, it's both just... incredibly lovable. And both films deal with the onset of sudden fame and how some people are simply not able to deal with it. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, there's a great line in this David Barry movie, a documentary about David Barry made in the 70s, and he's talking to the girl, and he just says, you know, listen, 99% of the people this happens to can't begin to get their heads around it. I think that's why he created all these personas. I think that's why Amy created that persona. It's just like a kind of, you know, it's a distraction. It's just like a diversion. I think it must be very hard, you know. I mean, we went to the Cannes Film Festival with the movie, and we were the subject of quite a lot of attention, and even that was quite hard to deal with, and it's like a million of what these people go through. So... You can only imagine the kind of pressure it brings, you know, when you're still trying to maintain your artistic integrity and all that kind of stuff. It must be very difficult. It must be very confusing. And I've got to ask about Exit Through the Gift Shop by famous street artist Banksy. Can you enlighten us as to whether the documentary is real or whether it is, in fact, a faux documentary artwork from Banksy? Well, it's definitely an artwork from Banksy, but it's definitely a complete, it's a complete verity. I mean, what people just can't except with that film, I understand, because it is him, so they're naturally suspicious. It, it basically, it rolled out exactly the way we describe it in the movie. You know, we were trying to make one movie about street art, and then literally the Terry, Terry missile impacted the size of the production, and they just took us down a completely different path, one which we never saw coming. And you know what? If you ever meet Terry, <laughs> you'll understand why... It, it is as radically insane as we as we purport in the movie because he is just a complete he's another one off he's, just, he's a complete maniac albeit a very lovable maniac but no it is it is what we say it is I'm afraid that's true it's stranger than fiction in that case.